so guys uh, let's continue uh, so in the previous class sort of we uh, finished discussing uh, the uh, Hamilton Jacobi uh, method right and we applied it uh, to solve um, the problem about harmonic oscillator right just example which we solved using all possible methods and then we started discussing the second example right um, slightly more complicated because you have more uh, variables right and the uh, um, Hamilton Jacobi equation is yeah it's more complicated right okay so we started looking at this we we discussed all this uh, in the previous class at the end of the previous class now I, I prepared it in advance so we have a single particle m no constraints basically free particle exposed to this uh, potential and of course we discussed that this is not a central potential right it's not a central force because there is a dependence on phi and theta immediately it's just some potential <coughs> all right uh, and um, yeah and of course uh, phi is the azimuth right and theta is the polar angle right and so then uh, we wrote down Hamiltonian, right? So here's the Hamiltonian. Uh, and as usual, in the Hamilton Jacobi equation, we used um, generating function of the second type. And of course, we renamed it, you remember, it's just S, which we call Hamilton's principal function, which depends on Q small p capital, right? And these are two equations which are supposed to give us uh, transformation equations, right? And uh, expression for the new Hamiltonian, which is zero uh, in this approach. We want to go to the place where Hamiltonian is zero. And of course, we use this equation, we plug it into that expression. And as a result, you ended up with hamilton jacobi equation. So this is basically uh, Hamiltonian, where all the p's are replaced with ds over dq, it's ds over dr, ds over d theta, ds over d phi instead of p phi, p theta, and p r. And we added ds over dt, because that's how Hamiltonian gets transformed once you move from one set of variables to a, a different set of variables. Okay, so at this point we need to start solving hamilton jacobi equation right and of course as i told you it can be solved only if you can separate variables otherwise it can be ridiculously complicated in equation first order uh partial differential equation with uh how many variables r theta phi and t four variables first order differential equations with four variables and so now let's start looking at this differential equation carefully right uh hoping that we can use uh those recipes which we developed uh in the previous class in the previous class so first of all you can see immediately that t is cyclic and as i told you in the previous class this is the only good news right t is cyclic yeah we can uh we can use that first recipe but neither r nor theta nor phi are cyclic so the second recipe can be used here immediately right and but i told you right so what else can we what else can we do right we as i told you we, we can just right, uh, fill our hearts with hope and just dive uh, into the separation hoping that it will work right but first of all <coughs> uh, let me write about time right uh, and of course, uh, we can use that recipe. So, which way wrote? Okay. Uh, so, since T is cyclic, right? So immediately we can search for the solution in this form as principal function equals to the um, Hamilton's characteristic function, which is the function of what R theta phi, right? And minus alpha 1 t okay now instead of alpha naught i use alpha 1 so i will just use we will have several um, constants and i started with alpha 1 i think yeah yeah i used alpha 1 <coughs> okay so we can use immediately uh, the first recipe okay let me frame it <coughs> and then the rest none of this uh cyclic so uh, just as i told you uh, let's just dive hoping that we will be able to separate okay <clears throat> um, so maybe i will write so r phi theta are not cyclic cyclic 
But let's try. But let's try to separate them. Right, because nothing else we, we left. We can just try it. <coughs> and uh, search for the solution, right, W uh, as W1 which depends on R, W2 depends, which depends on theta, and W3, which depends on phi. But let me write immediately the whole S, right? So, separate, I will put comma, semicolon, and S equals, so, W1, which depends on R, plus W2, which depends on theta, I think W2 depends on theta, yeah. And W three depends on phi. Sometimes <clears throat> people use subscripts r, theta, and phi, which I think probably even better. And minus alpha one t. Right, so we search for a solution in this form. Again, this is the recipe and this is our hopes, right? Um, yeah, probably I should also frame it because it's uh, important. Okay, so now what? <clears throat> we just need to shove it into the uh, hamilton jacobi equation and see what we can get out of that. Okay, so I will just need to rewrite it one more time. Lots of rewriting, lots of rewriting in this approach. So it will be 1 over uh, 2m. Uh, so instead of ds over dr, we will have only dw over dr because this doesn't have r dependencies and this is a partial derivatives. Uh, dw1 over dr, right, then plus 1 over 2mr squared. Now it's a dw2 over d theta squared plus 1 over uh, 2mr squared sine squared theta dw3 over d phi squared then that term stays because it doesn't have any s's so a sine 2 phi divided by r squared sine squared theta and ds over dt uh, immediately gives us minus alpha 1, right, minus alpha 1. And I can, you know what, let me move it uh, to the uh, right-hand side immediately with plus, right, equals to alpha 1. So that's what we have now, right. And basically we uh, remove t immediately, yeah, we separated t. Now let's look at this carefully, uh, hoping for separation. This term depends on r. Here we have presence of r in the form of r, r squared. In this term also, presence of r only in the terms of r squared. So we have exactly the same presence, form of the presence of r squared. And even here, the same form of, of uh, r squared presence, right? And this is free of r squared. So it looks like if I multiply the whole equation by r squared, Additional presence of R will appear over here, which is which is good because this whole thing depends on R, right? R square uh, presence of R will disappear here, and presence of R will disappear there, and here as well. Of course, it will appear there, but it will be just the presence of R. So we can combine this term with that term, and that will be the construction where we will have only uh, presence of R, R, and the derivatives with respect to R, right? But of course, I will make even uh, half a step deeper. I'm, I'm going to multiply not just by r squared. I'm going to multiply by uh, 2m r squared. Well, just to get, of this, uh, get rid of that 2m. Right. I found it slightly more convenient. Okay, so what I'm going to do, let me write it over here on this side of the board. So the whole equation will be multiplied by uh, 2m r squared. Right? Okay, and now let me rewrite what we are going to get. Uh, I'm thinking, should I just rewrite one more time or should I start moving terms around immediately? <laughs> All right, that's the dilemma. All right, um, okay, let's do it step by step. R squared dw1 over dr. 
okay, squared, I forgot here, squared, right? Uh, plus uh, dw2 over d theta squared uh, plus 1 over 2 mr squared disappears. So we'll have 1 over sine squared theta and um, dw3 over d phi squared and plus 2m will appear in the denominator 2ma sine 2 phi divided by uh, sine squared theta and equals to m r squared alpha 1. Right. Okay, so now uh, this, this r dependence and this guy will have have only uh, theta and phi dependence. Damn it. Probably I should have moved term, uh, terms around. Again, I will have to rewrite it. Right. Um, <clears throat> feels like uh, wasting time a little bit. Okay, so uh, now, of course, uh, I will move this over here. I think I moved that way, yeah. So it will be r squared dw1 over dr squared, that minus 2m. Uh, r, r squared alpha 1. And these two terms I will move to that side. Okay, three terms with minuses, of course, it will be. Let me save some space. So it will be uh, minus, minus, uh, minus dw2 over d theta squared minus 1 over sine squared theta dw3 over d phi squared minus and minus minus 2 ma sine 2 phi over sine squared theta. Ooh. Okay, and now the same arguments like I, I told you before in the previous classes. So here we have dependence on r, here we have dependence on phi and theta. And of course it must be correct, it doesn't matter uh, which are which are theta and phi. So if you keep, for example, theta and phi the same and start changing this, so this side changing, that side stays the same. It's, it's, not, it's not an equation. Or you can reverse situation, right? Keep r the same, start changing this. So the left, uh, the right hand side will be changing this constant. It's, again, it's impossible. So it's only possible to have this equation for any r, for any theta, for any phi, only when this is constant and this is the same constant over here, right? Okay, so let's, uh, we introduced already alpha 1, now let's introduce alpha 2. So this is equal to alpha 2, right? Right, so now uh, we're getting the equation for, D, uh, for W1, right? So this equals to that, so. As a result, um, we're getting the equation for, okay, uh, r, you know what, I will move r squared immediately to that side. So it will be uh, dw1 over dr squared minus 2m alpha 1 equals 2 alpha 2 divided by r squared. So the equation for w1. Right. Okay, that can be easily solved. Right. And uh, we're getting the integral for W1. So it will be in integral over R, of course, right? Integration over R. And this plus that. Ah, square root. Square root, first of all. Right. Um, alpha 2 over r squared plus 2m alpha 1 uh, dr. Let me check if I got what I have here. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we managed to separate r. So, and we found uh, w1. Right. Okay, let me 
uh, frame it because at the end I will have to collect all these uh, achievements. But for now we need to move further because we still have uh, here mass of theta and phi. So it's a first, no it's a second step. The first was here, now the second. And so now this must be equal to alpha 2. You know what, let me rewrite this equation right, separately. And I will move uh, minus to that side. So, and uh, so dw2 over d theta squared plus 1 over sine squared theta dw3 over d phi squared plus okay I pretty much multiplied the whole equation by minus one right and the thing is yeah before I didn't uh, solve this equation like a couple of years before before but then uh, when I assign something like this on the exam or on the homework, uh, I know students had troubles uh, moving these terms around and separating variables. So that's why I, um, I'm going over that. So now again, we need to look at this uh, carefully. Presence of theta here, sine squared and here, sine squared, the same presence. Uh, this is pure dependence on theta. Here, no dependence on anything. So if you multiply the whole equation by sine squared, presence of theta will appear here. It will increase the presence of theta in the first term, but anyway, it will be still depend only on theta. So we can combine this term with that term uh, that will have dependence on theta and over here will have dependence on phi only. So we will be able to separate um, theta and phi, right? So now let's do it. Uh, so I need to multiply the whole equation by, um, I'm just, just thinking, should I, um, ah, sine square theta. Just want to get exactly the same like in my notes, but of course you can, you can introduce constant in a different form, right? It's, there are lots of freedom. <clears throat> okay, anyway. So as a result, um, yeah, this term, I will move immediately to this side with plus, so it will be uh, sine squared theta, this derivative, dw2 over d theta uh, squared, then this term will be with plus plus alpha 2 uh, sine squared theta. And these terms, okay, I will probably move to that side with minus. So it will be minus dw3 over d phi squared and minus, again, sine squared will disappear. So minus 2ma sine of 2 phi, right. Again, the same arguments. Here, dependence on theta. There we have dependence on phi only. It's only possible uh, when uh, they're equal to the same constant. So we can introduce the uh, last constant, alpha 3, right? So we managed to separate. Uh, and so now we have two equations. And the first one, uh, this can be solved for W2. So let me first write, uh, solve it for dW2 uh, over d theta squared. It will be equal to alpha 3 divided by sine squared with plus, yeah, alpha 3 divided by sine squared theta and minus this, right, divided by sine, so it will be just minus alpha 2, right, yeah. Of course, I can take square root with small adjustments, right, and I can write integral immediately. So the answer will be written in terms of an integral. Right. 
So W2, which is the function of theta? Right. Probably over here I should have written it's a function of R, right? Function of R equals function of theta uh, will be integral over theta and the square root alpha 3 divided by sine squared theta minus alpha 2 and d theta. Okay, so that's the second integral. Okay, let me frame it with blue because as I said, I will have to collect them in a few minutes. So this solution, this solution, that solution. And now we need to uh, get W3. So uh, where is that equation? This one. Ah, it's simpler. So dw over d, dw3 over d phi, dw3 over d phi equals, okay, square root immediately. So it will be, ah, it's with minus, minus. So it will be square root. Um, both of them will be negative, so minus alpha 3 and minus that term, right? Hmm. In my notes, I'm getting one term with plus, okay. Now I'm, I need to find out. <coughs> What did I do? Okay, let me write what I'm getting and then I will start looking because I, I cannot see immediately. Um, I'm getting with minus. Minus alpha 3 and minus uh, 2ma sine 2 phi. Right. In my notes, I'm getting what? Uh, this is positive alpha 3. And it confuses me. Where, it, where did I manage to uh, lose one minus? This is correct. Alpha uh, sine squared. plus goes to that side with minus All right then minus that and No, I, I, I cannot see any, any, any mistakes, right? Okay, it's not a big deal, if, even if uh, minus somewhere I lost, right? Because anyway, we cannot get uh, the final. We'll just uh, leave it in the form of, of, um, of an integrals. Right. Let's see what bugs me. <laughs> Although it's possible I made a mistake in my notes. Right, occasionally I find that. Right. Yeah, I think I made a mistake in my notes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, we we can rewrite it in the form of an integral, although it's obvious. Right. So uh, W three equals to uh, an integral, of course, that minus alpha 3 minus 2ma uh, sine of 2 phi. 
and of course the phi. Okay, so that's the last piece in our solution. So now let's combine them uh, and write down the final form of this uh, Hamilton's principal function. So back to S, right? So as a result, S will be equal. Okay, so long, long uh, function. Where is my W1? This one. That's why I needed to frame them. So it will be a square root of alpha 2 over r to the power of 2 plus 2m alpha 1 uh, dr then plus w2 here this so it will be integral of course it's integration of r integration of a theta um, square root of alpha 3 divided by sine squared theta minus alpha 2 and d theta now this plus integral of minus alpha 3 minus 2 ma sine 2 phi d phi okay that's my phi and the last minus alpha 1 t and minus alpha 1 t okay so that's our uh, Hamilton's principal function which I, again you remember it's a generating function of the second type which leads us to uh, new canonical coordinates where Hamiltonian equals to zero Okay, and uh, so now we can write down, of course, um, our solutions in the new world where Hamiltonian equals to zero, and then we will need to write down the equations to go back, right, to the old world, right. Okay, I will erase these multiplications, uh, those factors, All right. Okay, so now uh, solutions. Of course, you remember they are constants, right? But anyway, so let me write them down. So first, Q capital dot equals to partial derivative, of course, of K with respect to uh, P, right? And since K equals zero, so Q dot equals zero. So Q is uh, QI, since now we have several variables, right? Yeah, QI. So we can write that qi equals to some constants let's call them beta and similar we can write for pi dot equals to minus partial derivative of k with respect to qi equals to zero so of course uh, pi's are going to be also constants and you remember we recycle our constants which we get uh, from hamilton jacobi equation so our, our alpha 1 alpha 2 uh, alpha 2 and alpha 3 so we're going to use them uh, as our generalized momenta so it's a alpha which we wrote it just alpha i i guess i right yeah right our constants alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 3 Okay, so now uh, we just need to go back. And in order to go back, uh, this equation will give us immediately the evolution of the system, right? So let's just grab this. So now go back. All right, so it will be Q1, uh, which is uh, some constant beta 1, right? It's this. Uh, must be equal to the partial derivative of that s with respect to right, partial derivative of s with respect to uh, p1 capital and of course p1 it's alpha 1 we use our constants this alpha 1 so it will be partial derivative of s with respect to alpha 1 
right? Okay, so now we need to differentiate all that mass, right? So where <coughs> alpha one is present here, um, do, 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 and there, the last term. So let me start with the last one. Uh, so it will be minus t, all right? Uh, and this, okay, so it will be uh, plus integral uh, square root will be, will go in downstairs. So it will be uh, in the denominator r squared plus 2m alpha 1, right? Then 1 over 2 and 2m. 2m and d r right so that's um first um road home back home right yeah of course t you can be of course you can remove i mean a two can be removed uh and so after integration what are you going to get uh and inversion of course you need to integrate then invert and you will get r as a function of time and constants. You see alpha 1, alpha 2, and beta 1. So after inverting, of course, we're not going to do it. <laughs> it's too much of a mess, right? Uh, so it will be r will be a function of a time, then alpha 1, alpha 2, uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, and beta 1. And beta 1. Yeah. So basically, immediately you see how uh, our coordinate changes with time. But it's the first one. We still have two equations of this type. Right. So now uh, beta 2 will be q2 and partial derivative of s with respect to p2, which is the partial derivative of s with respect to alpha 2. Again, so now we need to look through carefully uh, so this S searching for alpha 2's, right? So it's here, uh, then there, it's just alpha 2 without anything else. Yeah, yeah, true. <clears throat> and, and nothing else in two spots. Okay, so now let's do it. Uh, so integral over R and again square root will be downstairs. So it will be alpha 2 over r squared plus 2m alpha 1. And upstairs again, again it's 1 over 2. In and alpha 2 will give us 1 over r squared. Again, it's a partial derivative. So it will be 1 over r squared and dr. Okay. Uh, and the second is here, second presence of alpha 2 plus integral. Again, this goes in the basement. Alpha 3 over sine squared theta minus alpha 2. Then 1 over 2 upstairs. And minus 1 when you differentiate alpha 2 inside, minus alpha 2 inside. So it will be minus 1 and d theta, right? So that's the big mass for the second. <clears throat> and so what can you get out of this? If you integrate this, then integrate that, you will get what? r will be here, theta will be there. And if you invert it, you will be able to get depend how r depends on theta. Right, so if you use, just if you invert this, you will get, of course, R, uh, okay, let me, okay, maybe I will write underneath. So from here, you can get R as a function of theta, or if you want to see uh, time dependence, how R depends on time, you will need to grab R, this R from the first equation, shoved it into this equation after it after integration and then you will have what you will have uh, here you'll have only time dependence this is constant and here you have theta invert it and you will get how theta depends on time and bunch of constants right so if you use this over here in that case you will end up 
So I use green color, sort of related to that substitution. So you will get R, a theta as a function of time. Theta as a function of time and bunch of constants, right? Time, alpha, all those alphas, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and beta uh, 2, right? So you will get function of time and a bunch of constants. And so the last one. Now we need to, uh, d d d okay, uh, Q3. So it will be, okay, let me put small bullets here, here, and now there. So beta 3 will be equal to Q3. All right, so this. And yeah, it's a partial derivative of the principal function with respect to P capital 3, which is alpha 3. Again, order which constant you use instead of P1, it's up to you. Again, it's not unique, right? Uh, all, with all those constants, you will end up, with the, in, end up in the world where Hamiltonian equals to 0. For example, if you um, over here, beta 1, and instead of P1, you can use, for example, alpha 3 or alpha 2. Right? Or here, instead of alpha 2, you could have used alpha 1 or alpha 3, right? They have pl plenty of freedom. <clears throat> okay, so now let's finally differentiate a couple of integrals. In this case, alpha 3 here and there, right? So you will end up with integral alpha 3 over sine squared theta minus alpha 2. And uh, 1 over sine, okay, first of all, 1 over 2, and then 1 over sine squared theta, and d theta. And that uh, will give us plus, again, integral, then square root, downstairs, minus alpha 3, minus alpha, oh, two, 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 two. Uh, 2 ma. Uh, sine to phi and uh, we're differentiating with respect to alpha 3 so it will be 1 over 2 and minus 1 1 over 2 times minus 1 and d phi right so again so what what can we get out of this uh, so here you'll get theta dependence there phi dependence so if you integrate and invert, you will be able to get, uh, for example, how theta depends on phi or phi depends on theta, right? So from here, of course, you can get uh, how, um, oh, let's say phi, how phi uh, depends on theta. Or again, if you use the uh, results from the previous, right? So if you use that theta, how theta depends on time if you shoved it into the first integral after integration into the first term you will have only here time dependence phi dependence and bunch of constants so you'll be able to see how phi depends on time and bunch of constants or how phi depends on time and those constants alphas and betas Big, big mess, <laughs> but yeah, we are sort of learning the procedure, right? In this case, getting to the final result is not that uh, simple, not like with a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so, but again, the goal was uh, to go over these uh, motions, right? Move terms around, multiply something by something, right? in order to separate variables because I was surprised when uh, for the like last two, three years, I realized that students first uh, kind of have had issues with uh, problems like that. Before I didn't use, I didn't solve this problem because it's kind of too messy. Okay, so after this you should be able, so you see it's a quite straightforward.
quite straightforward, right? Nothing um, ridiculously complicated, right? If the question is not about actually getting the explicit dependency, right? So now the small uh, piece before we uh, move out of this chapter, let's look at the physical interpretation of Hamilton's principal function. Just one interesting moment, which, okay, it's not that crucial uh, for uh, understanding the procedure, but I feel like it's, it's very interesting. Let's, let's discuss that. Okay, I need to uh, start erasing this. Cool, All right. It's a new black marker and at the very beginning it's difficult to erase it. Yeah, you have it all. Okay, so let me write a uh, physical interpretation of S. <clears throat> okay, and interesting, and interesting. physical interpretation uh, of S. Okay, looks like, okay. Our Hamilton's principal function, which is in, in by its nature, just a generating function of the second type. Okay, so let's assume that we solve the problem and we know how uh, coordinates, all coordinates Q depends on time and of course a bunch of constants, right? So let's assume, let's write, uh, assume we solve the problem, solve a problem and as a result we know how QI uh, depends, which way I wrote it, yeah, just QI depends on those constants, alphas, betas, and time. It's sort of like this, right? And then here, theta and that. So let's assume that we know life of the system. We know uh, the sort of trajectory of the system, right? Or we can say we know the evolution of the system. Okay, so, and you know what, let me write that S of course, it's the function of q, uh, p, right, and time. Okay. Now, let's evaluate uh, the total time derivative of S along these solutions. So basically, q's here, instead of p's, we know that p's are uh, our constants of integration from the hamilton jacobi equation, right? So let's just take the total time derivative of S along this uh, um, trajectory of, this, of, of the system, right? This, along the solution of the system, right? Okay, so now let me write... <clears throat> okay, uh, let me write, so let's take... Uh, ds over dt uh, along, um, which way should I write? Okay, along the path. Along, uh, okay, let me write like this. Trajectory of a system. Basically along the solution. Okay, so now let's do it. So ds over dt, right? Uh, should I write? Yeah, probably I should write qi. Uh, then uh, pi, it's a constant, right? And then time dependence, right? So 
I just wrote explicitly what uh, S depends on. Because again, we're uh, differentiating um, when S is evaluated along the solution. All right, so Q is that, P is constant, and time. Okay, so uh, there are several Qs, right? So summation over I from one to N, uh, partial derivative of S with respect to Qi and Qi dot. Then P's are constant because again, we uh, assume that we differentiate S evaluated along the uh, solution. So this will give us zero and then plus partial derivative of S with respect to time. Okay, now, again, S, it's a generating function of the second type. So you remember that um, dS partial derivative of S with respect to Qi, that is a Pi. Right, so that those generating functions, uh, generating equations, which we, uh, which I erased, they were here, right? So it means that uh, this is okay. Of course, I can shove it here. So this is our uh, pi, and then. Again, S, it's a Hamilton's principal function, which leads us to the place where Hamiltonians equals to zero. So it means that uh, what K equals to H plus uh, DS over DT equals to zero, right? So as a result, this DS over DT equals to minus H. So this is equal to minus Hamiltonian. Okay, so now uh, we can continue. It is equal to uh, what? Summation over I, uh, pi qi dot minus Hamiltonian. What is this? P times q dot minus h. That was our transition. It's basically a genre transformation, which allows us to go from, uh, Lagra from, the Hamil from the Hamiltonian to the Lagrangian, right? You remember the genre transformation? You just uh, create this uh, product, variable which you want to remove, variable which you want to introduce if you want to go from uh, h to l, right? This is Lagrangian. So we're actually in the world of Hamiltonian, actually. We've been here for, for the last, I know, 10 classes. And now this to uh, total time derivative of S with respect to time evaluated along the solution, it's the Lagrangian of the system. It's completely unexpected, right? I, <laughs> not intuitive at all, right? So uh, recall the past. Recall the past, right? That's a, the that's a Lagrangian. And now even worse, look, uh, this is ds over dt equals to that. Okay, of course we can integrate it, right? Okay, let me write. So uh, ds over dt equals to the Lagrangian. And of course we can integrate it over time. And of course we will end up that, we will end up as s equals Okay, let me write S over, still it's a QI, then our alpha constants, which are uh, P, right? And then time equals to what? Integral of LDT, right? Uh, and what plus uh, the constant of integration, of course, if you uh, if you integrate in indefinite integral, right? So in which constant I use? Okay, s as some initial moment of time. What is this? It's an action integral. So s our Hamilton's principal function. It's an action integral. 
it's like you know when when you when you saw first time saw it it's uh, it's uh, okay not mind blowing but <laughs> interesting right because again we've been doing what for the last several classes since we introduced canonical transformation we we try to go hell knows where as far as possible right in order to uh, get the best the easiest solutions right uh, and now we went to sort of uh, with the ultimate simplification when the Hamiltonian equals to zero but it looks like now we and we introduced this Hamilton's principal function right some fancy s right but actually just the action the action integral it feels like we've been just wandering around among three trees right trying to get lost right in the woods of three trees right uh, <laughs> and everything was here right it's 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 mesmerizing um but of course you at this point you can start kind of huh you remember our troubles uh, in those canonical transformations because every time we had the vicious circle in order to get canonical transformation equations you need to know generating function but we didn't have any procedure how to get those generating functions right basically like vicious circle and it looks like now who we can get uh, Hamilton's principal function using maybe this but the thing is in order to get this uh, Hamilton's principal function from this approach you need to know the solution you need to evaluate it along the solution along the true uh no uh evolution of the system right so in order to write uh hamilton's principal function you need to know the solution but why do we need hamilton's principal principal function in order to find the solution again the same kind of vicious circle yeah, we can uh, write Hamilton's principal function from here, but you need to know the solution. And we need Hamilton's principal function to get the solution. Right. It's an interesting, yeah, it's a, I think it's, it's a worth of remembering of this fact. But of course, in terms of uh, solving problems, it doesn't uh, make our life better. But it's good to realize that uh, um, there is this very, very uh, interesting uh, interpretation. Again, you cannot use it in the problems, but I cannot resist. I, I, I cannot skip it. I skip this. Right. Okay, so at this exciting moment, right, we can finish this chapter, right, and move to the um, next chapter, right, coupled oscillations. Where I get this uh, this phrase at, at at this and at this exciting moment we can uh, we, we 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 will close the pro we we will end the program. It's uh, if you watched ever watch Top Gear, that's how Jeremy Clarkson usually finished the <laughs> the, uh, the program, right? <clears throat> of course, I cannot mimic him, right? And <clears throat> okay, so enough enough of this. Uh, so enough of the Hamiltonian formalism. So we've pretty much discussed everything that we might need um, sort of in general. Of course, you can do applications, right? Uh, but we almost discussed um, everything that important. So now uh, let me erase this and coupled oscillations. So let me erase, write the title. And then uh, the idea how we can address that. No, first of all, which systems, which systems. And then general idea. It's chapter six. I think we move back. Right. So chapter six, coupled oscillations. Coupled oscillations. It's a reasonably long chapter probably not the most exciting first uh, for the first several years i was i discussed this chapter closer to the beginning of the semester but you know every time when you dive into this couple of oscillations it's not very exciting it's not it's kind of tedious right <laughs> i don't want to say the word boring but right um not very exciting so as a result i moved it to the end of the semester closer to the end of the semester so first of all uh, in undergraduate level course, of course, you discussed oscillations, but every time you had what? You had a uh, single particle or some uh, object, but anyway, there was only one oscillating object, right? 
okay, under the influence of one force or two forces, right? But every time we had only one object. Now, of course, we're going to increase complexity. Instead of using one object, we're going to use n objects, maybe two, maybe three, maybe hundred, maybe millions, right? But multiple particle, multi-particle system. And the worse even, uh, they're going to be all um, connected basically coupled system. What does it mean coupled system? It means that motion of this particle is going to affect the motions of the rest of the particles. And motions of the rest of the particles are going to affect the motion of this particle. Right? Coupled system, of course. It's a gigantic, gigantic mess. Let me first write a couple of, draw a couple of uh, ex examples of these systems. And then we will start uh, sort of trying to understand the strategy of this approach because that must be clear because it's a it's otherwise it's a big big mess okay uh, examples of the systems all right uh, for example atoms in a crystal lattice right well, let's let's use one dimensional right okay examples of our systems Okay, let me put um, atoms in a crystal lattice. Thing. Yeah, double T. All right, so something like this. Let's say you have one atom, then, of course, uh, electric, uh, they are sort of um, the nature of the connections between atoms, of course, electromagnetic, but very often we can just model it using springs, right? In classical mechanics, of course, right? right. Uh, so then another, then another, and so on, right? So you can have something like this, right? So M, 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 or oh, sometimes they're different, right? It depends. Uh, then uh, you can uh, also, for example, model uh, some molecules all right, so let's say you have, uh, let me start with a circle. And let's say you have first atom, then sort of like a spring. Then there's a, the second atom in a molecule. Then again, there is a spring. Then there is a third atom. Actually, at some point, I remember we solved the problem like this. But of course, it's so lengthy, right? Um, very, very tedious. So let's say you have M1, M2, M3, and of course, case, they can be the same, can be different, right? It depends on the situation. Or uh, a system which uh, you might have seen already in undergraduate level course, right? So you can see something like this. So um, simple pendulum. Okay, not simple pendulum, a mass uh, spring system, right? So let's say K. Uh, here, let's say M capital. And if we attach here a simple pendulum, so Bob with mass L, with length L, with length L. Again, coupled system. So the approach which we're going to develop can be used here. So it depends. Okay, so now general idea, the strategy to this, uh, to, uh, of the approach. It's sort of like before, in the battle, before you start doing some actual actions, generals must decide. So first we're going this way, then we turn that way, then that way, and so on. So now we need to discuss that general approach. Okay, system like this, N particles, uh, they all can oscillate uh, in different directions. Uh, with different frequencies, different phases, right? It's a basically an infinite number of possible oscillations, really ocean of possibilities. It basically, if you try to imagine it, it will blow up your mind, right, completely. It's an infinite number of possible oscillations. So, but of course, out of that sea of oscillations, there must be oscillations, definitely there must be oscillations when or where all particles of the system 
oscillates with exactly the same frequency out of that sea of uh, infinite sea of all possible oscillations definitely there must be oscillations like that when all particles let's say you have n particles they all oscillate with exactly the same frequency the key word they all oscillate with exactly the same frequency of course it means it does it means that they can oscillate maybe in different directions maybe this oscillates like this this will oscillate like that right maybe with different phase right maybe out of phase maybe in phase right but the keyword they must oscillate with exactly the same frequency the rest doesn't matter all right okay and and um later we will see that if you have a system of n with n degrees of freedom then it's possible to see n oscillations of this type when the whole system when all particles oscillates with exactly the same frequency of course frequencies will be different right omega 1 omega 2 omega 3 and so on right so we will, we will be able to we will be able to find n oscillations like this right and uh, these oscillations plays the crucial role right uh, and since they play the crucial role, of course, it makes sense to give them nice, cool name. We're going to call them normal modes, normal modes of the system. Okay, now we need to get one additional, imp very important piece of information before we come to the conclusion, right? What can you say about these oscillations in terms of uh, their, them being independent or linearly dependent? And, and all the time we are going to discuss only small oscillations small displacements from equilibrium i should have started with this right we are going to discuss only small oscillations so what can you tell about those normal modes those modes when all the particles oscillates with the same frequency they are linearly independent because it's sort of like a, in linear optics you remember uh, in linear optics, it's impossible uh, to have transformation of frequencies, right? So light can propagate from one media to another one, right? So different things can happen, but frequency stays the same. Because we discuss only small amplitudes, right? So uh, linear optics, of course, and as a result, uh, frequencies, um, it's impossible, for example, to generate frequency omega 2 out of omega 1. Because we're only discussing small amplitudes, in this case, small oscillation. So all these n normal modes, they linearly independent because we discuss only small oscillations. It's impossible to have frequency conversion. So now we have n basically solutions of the system, n modes, and they're all linearly independent. So now how can you construct a general solution? Piece of cake. You just construct a linear combination of all these n normal modes. So that's the strategy uh, to, uh, to address these problems. Otherwise, it's a, it's a big, big mess, right? So the key word, we need to find normal modes where all particles oscillate with the same frequency. And then once we manage to find them, we can construct linear combination uh, of them. And um, you remember, if you have n degrees of freedom and if you have n particular solutions, linearly independent then if you construct linear combination that's the solution right. so that's that's what we're going to do okay so i will probably be able only to state uh, the problem the system and um probably i will start with okay i will put new bullet and uh, first we're going to discuss of course uh, coupled systems okay let me state all these uh, key points so coupled systems coupled uh, system systems uh, with n uh, degrees of freedom I didn't introduce abbreviation. Of course, we can abbreviate as D or F, for example, right? Right. So far, I never used it, these abbreviations. All right, then, what uh, next? Um, 
Ah, uh, yeah. We're going to discuss conservative system and we're going to use Lagrangian formalism, not Hamiltonian. We're going to use Lagrangian formalism. And since we're going to use the typical Lagrange equation, so of course we're going to restrict ourselves to a conservative system. So uh, forces uh, acting between objects are going to be conservative, right? <coughs> so probably I should write it's a number one, it's a number two, uh, which we wrote conservative system conservative uh, systems All right. uh, so it means that uh, potential energy will depend only on position no finicky stuff no dependencies on the velocities or time dependencies right so conservative systems so v uh, it's a function of q which just from 1 to n q n right so then third we're going to assume small oscillations only, right? Small oscillations, of course, around stable equilibrium points. So small amplitude oscillations, yeah. So small uh, amplitude oscillations. Right. Okay, yeah, probably should write, write, write around equilibrium points. <clears throat> My whiteboard is getting loose a little bit. And the last piece, I think, yeah, <clears throat> the last piece. We're going to assume that uh, transformation equations, we will see that we're not going to use these coordinates. We will move to somewhere else. Right. You will see in a second. But anyway, uh, we're going to, <clears throat> those transformation equations are going to be time independent. Very important uh, statement. Uh, transformation equations are time independent. Basically, it means that system is not driven. Right. Okay, so these are, I think, four major. Ah, yeah, I need to write. So Ri, uh, it's a function of only coordinates. Oops. No time dependence. <clears throat> okay, so now, okay, we still have five minutes, good. So now let's start developing. All right, so first let me draw a system uh, similar to this. All right. It's easier to analyze uh, a system of that type when everything along a line. All right, um, okay, probably I need to sort of draw a line. And now, uh, probably I will draw it like this. So, first mass, then uh, the second mass, then again spring, then another mass, then again a spring, and so on. Right. First of all, of course, we need to uh, introduce coordinate system and original coordinates. Let's assume some kind of cues. It's not our final coordinates. Right. Um, so, yeah, I usually use green. Right. So let's. So, uh, so current positions of these masses. They're already displaced from the equilibrium, right? Some arbitrary uh, positions. So these uh, I can label, for example, Q1, uh, Q2, Q3, and so on. Right. And oh, okay, let's start with zero. I think I started. No, no, no. It's fine. Q1. Right. Then let's assume that uh, equilibrium. Uh, this equilibrium points. Equilibrium points. Let's say this is Q1 zero. This is Q20, this is Q30, and so on. Right. But of course, since there are oscillations around equilibrium points, it makes sense to introduce a different coordinates displacements from the equilibrium points. Right. So we're going to introduce these 
eta eta one, eta two, and eta three. Displacements from the equilibrium points. Okay, so now of course we can write uh, transformation equations, <laughs> which we will use, right? Probably I will write it immediately, right? Um, yeah, probably I should have stated the first row down the Lagrangian, but it's not a big deal. So effectively, we're going to make a transition from QIs to eta i's. So eta's are going to be our generalized coordinates, right? So, and of course the transformation equations, which are time independent. Uh, so it will be eta i equals to q i minus q i zero. So that's transfor transformation equation, right? So that's transformation equation. Of course, it should be framed because transformation equations are important, although it, in this case it's quite trivial. Right? And um, so, as I said, we're going to use Lagrangian formalism. So uh, L equals to T minus V. And since we're going to introduce eta's, and of course eta's are small, so I should have written this, right? So eta's are small displacements. It's a very important, and I kind of said, but didn't wrote, didn't write. Okay, so now it means that we need to expand. No, not need, we can, we can expand. T and V are in terms of eta's, right? Using Taylor expansions, right? And of course, we need to expand to which order? Of course, we need to expand to the second order terms. Why? Usually, uh, usually differential equation, you expand to the first order. But Lagrangian, every time you have to expand to the second order, because what do you do after that? You, you grab the Lagrangian and put it in the Lagrange equation, right? And after, differ after uh, differentiating the Lagrange equation, you will get the, uh, the, 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 okay. the first order terms, right? Okay, so, um, okay, let me start with, um, so, which we wrote, so we need to, uh, rewrite L in terms of, in uh, terms of eta's, right? So, and of course, use Taylor expansions. Taylor expansions. Okay, let's start with V, right? Which is a function of, of course, Q. Um, okay, let me write QI. And of course, it will be equal approximately V at Q I zero, then plus derivative partial derivative of V with respect to QI, of course, evaluated at the equilibrium points. That zero means at the equilibrium points, right? And times small displacement <coughs> eta I, and then plus one over two, second derivative of V with respect to QI, QJ, and again, evaluated at the equilibrium points, right? Function which depends on many variables, right? Expansion. <coughs> and then uh, eta i, eta j, right? Okay, so now let's quickly sim simplify. Of course, yes, summation over here over i and j uh, tacitly assumed, right? Summation over i and j. Okay, so this is constant. Constant. So we'll be, we can drop it. Then dy, dv over dqi. In chapter one, at the end of the chapter one, we showed that this is generalized force, right? Generalized force. 
Uh, of course, yeah, it's only correct when you have a conservative system, right? Generalized force evaluated at the equilibrium points, that is zero, right? Generalized force, it's zero. Right? So this is zero, right? Gen force, generalized force. And so as a result, we have only that. Let's give it a name and call it a day. So uh, let's call this, which way I probably I will first write. So V at QI equals to uh, one over two summation of. Okay, let me rewrite one more time. I thought about skipping it. V over QI, QJ, eta I, eta J. Right. Okay, so the potential energy matrix. Let's introduce potential energy matrix. So V I J uh, equals to partial derivative of V with respect to Q I U J. Of course, evaluated at zero. And it's called potential energy matrix, of course. Potential energy matrix. And quickly, properties. It doesn't matter if you differentiate first with respect to QJ and then QI. So it means that this matrix must be symmetric. Then, since it's just a normal potential energy, we just use Taylor expansion, of course, it must be real. So it's a, and of course, constant. Because you evaluate at a certain at a particular point. So here we have just a bunch of constants, right? Arranged in the matrix we're going to arrange. So it's a constant, real, symmetric matrix. So it's a... Um, v i j real symmetric matrix right okay so at this point uh, we will call it a day because this is the crucial which we are going to use and so next class we will expand kinetic energy write down the Lagrangian then Lagrange equations and after that We'll start analyzing the solutions. Right?